So um, I next would like to introduce Dr. Beth Marie Davis, who is going to be presenting today for us on midwives experiences within Canada's first alongside midwifery unit, impacts and implications for midwifery practice. Uh, Dr. Marie Davis is an associate professor in the midwifery education program and department of obstetrics and gynecology here at McMaster. And she's a co-PI for a CIHR clinician investigator team grant examining non-communicable diseases in obstetrics. Her current research interests include pregnant people's experiences of healthy nutrition and exercise during pregnancy and postpartum, fetal movement awareness, midwifery experiences of caring for complicated pregnancies, client and healthcare provider experiences of alternative models of practice for midwives, and client decision-making about birth. And Dr. Marie Davis has also worked as a midwife in Hamilton since 2003. So welcome Beth, and uh, please go ahead and and I just confirm that you can see just my presentation and not my notes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. And I have to warn everyone that my internet is unstable. So if I freeze in funny positions, that will just add to the excitement of the presentation. So thank you for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here and to share some results from our uh, large evaluation that we've been doing, uh, looking at the alongside midwifery unit in Markham. Um, so I'm here on behalf of our team, which includes Lindsay Grenier, Anne Malott, Liz Darling, Cam Carol Cameron, Eileen Hutton, and Christina Madison. So first, a little bit of background. Um, we know that in Ontario, the model of practice means that midwives offer clients a choice of birthplace that might include home, hospital, and where available, a birth center. Um, but the majority of midwife attended births in the province occur in a hospital setting. So with this in mind, I don't know if that was a motivating factor, but it certainly um, helps our ability to look at this new model, which began in 2018. So the Ministry of Health funded a pilot to provide an alternative model of intrapartum care for midwifery clients, where they could give birth in an alongside midwifery unit um, at the Markham Stouffville Hospital, which is now called Oak Valley Health. So the alongside midwifery unit or the AMU, as you'll hear me call it throughout the presentation is located within the hospital and operates separately from, but adjacent or nearby to uh, the obstetric unit. The proximity to the regular you know, labor and delivery unit allows for smooth transfer of care if needed in events of emergencies. And on the alongside unit, you'll see primarily two midwifery roles. Uh, the first is the community-based primary midwives who provide routine care for their clients through the prenatal and postpartum periods, and they attend the births of those clients on the AMU. They follow their clients through the course of care and work in that traditional caseload model um, that we see throughout the province. Those midwives work within an existing midwifery practice group or an MPG, uh, and the area where the AMU is situated has a catchment that includes three midwifery practice groups. The other type of midwife that you'll see practicing on the AMU is the hospitalist midwife, and this represents a new role in Ontario midwifery, but the hospitalist midwife is there to staff the unit. So they're actually hospital employees and they work uh, in shifts and someone is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Their role during the birth is to primarily take on that role of second midwife. So attending and providing infant care and support to the primary midwife during the time of birth but they may also um, take on many other roles. So they may field er early labor calls from clients. They may be the person who conducts a triage assessment. They will facilitate admission for clients and facilitate discharge. Uh, they may provide sleep and break relief for the primary midwife and support the primary midwife in other ways during the birth. Uh, they also act as a resource uh, to both the midwives and learners who might be present on the unit throughout um, different time periods. The other piece is that they act as a liaison between the AMU and the labor and delivery unit. They are often called on to like flex and pivot and uh, adapt to where the needs are in any given shift. And sometimes that means helping out more on labor and delivery and even um, offering skills such as surgical first assist. So although it is the first of its kind in Canada, midwifery-led units um, have been implemented in many other countries, and uh, some examples exist in the UK, New Zealand, the Netherlands, France, and, and uh, the growing body of literature related to this model shows that for people with low-risk pregnancies who give birth in the midwifery-led units, they are typically going to experience fewer maternal complications, fewer birth interventions, such as inductions, um, less lower rates of epidural, lower rates of instrumental birth and perineal lacerations, and a decreased chance of having their baby by cesarean section. 
Um, much of this literature comes through the uh, birthplace study out of the UK, um, but there is certainly growing evidence across all of these areas. Uh, there has been, I would say, most of the literature focused on outcomes and service user expectations and experiences and satisfaction, and less evidence related to the experiences of midwives within this model. So that was certainly something that we wanted to ensure that we um, explored in our research. And again, because this is a novel model of practice, we wanted to make sure that we were looking at all of the components of this. So this just gives you an overview of the different components that we uh, looked at in our evaluation. Uh, and so this came into under the umbrella of our practitioner experiences. We've previously presented and published on the um, healthcare provider experiences, and that included midwives and all the other healthcare providers. But the analysis I'm going to present today is really focused on the midwifery experience. So just quickly in terms of our methods, uh, this was a qualitative portion of the evaluation. Uh, we used primarily a grounded theory approach to our data collection and analysis. We conducted semi-structured interviews. Uh, the interview guide, so the questions that we asked were uh, created by our team based on the evidence in the literature. And the interviews were conducted by a clinician, sorry, a non-clinician researcher. Uh, we did have ethics approval uh, for both the local site and through our university at McMaster. We uh, invited all hospitalist midwives and community midwives who provide care on the AMU to participate. Our data was collected in the first few months of 2019. Interviews were audio recorded and transcribed, and then two researchers um, coded and clustered the codes into categories and then grouped those together into larger themes. And so what I'm gonna to share today are the broad themes that we've generated from this data. So in terms of our participants, uh, we had 14 total participants that represented four hospitalist uh, midwives and 10 community midwives. We did not collect demographic data uh, from this group of participants, and that was simply because it's such a small number and they are all very well known to each other uh, that we didn't want to collect a lot of uh, you know, identifying data that would mean that it would be possible to tell who was speaking and who was participating. Um, so this, I'm going to move through these four broad themes or the kind of central ways that we found that the alongside midwifery unit model impacted the experiences of midwives. And these relate to the midwifery philosophy of care, uh, the formation of relationships, hospital integration, and then also the impact on leadership. So I would say this was one of the, the largest areas um, of, of information that we uh, had from our participants. So the midwives were reflecting a lot about how the AMU model either maintained or hindered the core values and philosophy of midwifery in Ontario. I'm going to focus on four areas related to this. Um, and I would say that overall, the model was seen as being very positive and that it actually facilitated these core um, principles or philosophies of midwifery, potentially even better than the traditional model of care. So first, when it came to choice of birthplace, this uh, option of having the alongside midwifery unit was seen as being very helpful as an additional supplemental option, um, kind of the in-between between home and hospital as your choices for where to have your baby. And this was described by both clients and the midwives who participated in our research as the best of both worlds. When it came to continuity of care, we, you know, we weren't sure what we would hear from participants about the impact on continuity. And what we heard was actually two really important things. So the AMU model actually enhanced both the continuity of care approach, but it also served in many ways to actually reinforce and help to sustain continuity of carer. So that concept of having the known care provider. So when it came to ensuring a consistent approach, the hospitalist midwife um, was a key part of this. Clients felt that although they were meeting a new midwife, that the way that the care was provided and the approach to care was very much the same as they would have or that they did experience with their usual team. And they felt very much like the, head, the hospitalist midwife was an ex, essentially an, an extension of their care team. So there was that consistency um, of a model of care, and, and that felt like continuity for many people in the, in the client data we had, and the midwives we talked to also echoed that. We also heard how the AMU actually, uh, in ways, the staffing model supported this approach to continuity of carer. 
So the way that the hospitalist midwife was able to support the community midwives promoted greater likelihood that a known midwife would be present at the time of birth. So that meant, although the hospitalist might start an induction, um, that meant that the community midwife was more likely to be rested, able to stay at the birth, able to you know, come in when the person was active and therefore stay for the rest of the birth. They offered support at night for sleep, which also again meant that that primary midwife was more likely to be there at the time of the birth. Sometimes even took pages in early labor allowing the primary midwife to sleep before the person was active. Um, next, we heard lots from our participants about the impact of this model on their autonomy and their scope of practice. At the time that the AMU was opened, it's actually really important to note that this was an exemplar of one of the places where expanded scope was happening. Um, so for example, starting inductions of labor wasn't really happening on a provincial level. Obviously, now that's rolled out more universally, but um, this allowed some really important work to happen where midwives were able to use their autonomy, they were able to develop their own care standards, and they were able to um, decrease the need for consultations and transfers of care. Finally, we've uh, done some specific work looking at how the, the intentional design and the way that the space is configured actually promotes physiologic birth and the appropriate use of technology. So again, supporting one of those central pillars of midwifery. Um, so this the birth space included tools and equipment and had designs to support client choice and activity, mobilization, water births, upright births, um, and all of that was really appreciated by the midwives and allowed them to feel like they could flex their midwifery muscles. One participant said, if you have all of these tools and if you've access to the birthing stools and the balls and the slings and the water birth and all of the awesome stuff, you can put your money where your mouth is. You're, you can say, hey, we can have your baby in an upright position. Here's the tool that's going to get us there. So they felt like they were able to prov provide more optimal care. Next theme related to strengthening relationships. So the midwives described how the model impacted relationships both with themselves uh, as midwives and with other healthcare providers. So from an interprofessional lens, um, before the AMU opened, the relationships at the unit or in the hospital at some times were characterized by tension. Um, however, many intentional steps were taken during the um, implementation and planning for the AMU that meant that the other healthcare providers were involved. They felt like they had a voice in the implementation and that helped to build confidence and trust across the unit. Um, they also felt that the hospitalist midwife was a really important liaison role between the two units. And in particular, the obstetricians were able to form, you know, trustful and, you know, effective communication strategies with that group specifically, which allowed them to, um, you know, really support the interprofessional working and collaboration between units. The integration of the hospitalist midwife is also a really key part of this, that they function as essentially another member of that larger labor and delivery team. They are a go-between. They offer kind of an understanding of situational awareness between the two units, and they're able to help out on labor and delivery as needed. And I think that's appreciated and has gone a long way to strengthening those relationships. When it came to midwife to midwife relationships, uh, we did hear information from our participants that there were both positive and negative changes. So one of the huge implications in terms of positive change was feeling that they had a home base and they had a space for being just midwives. They felt like it was their home. They felt like it was a place to stay. They wanted to stay and hang out with each other. They felt a sense of ownership and belonging that they hadn't previously encountered. So one participant said, it's really nice to have a space where there's lots of camaraderie of the midwives. I know a lot of the midwives a whole lot better than I did before. When it came to some of the more negative or challenging experiences of the midwife to midwife relationships, this came from the new dynamic that had not existed before between the hospitalist midwife and the community midwife. So essentially, there was a little bit of a hierarchy or a little bit of kind of a conflict between uh, sometimes who was whose plan was going to be the, the plan that would be, um, you know, used in this particular person or birthing person's experience. And so there were times when there was pushback or um, challenges that needed to be worked through. Um, and that's certainly an experience that hadn't previously existed before for the midwives in that community. Finally, one of the ways that relationships were strengthened on the unit was also um, related to mentorship. So having a really clear plan for developing that role to support community midwives, to support students, and, and really, you know, kind of using that hospitalist midwife to be that key support person so that someone had someone they could bounce ideas off of in the middle of the night or be that extra set of eyes that looked at their strip um, and be an extra set of hands when needed. So uh, that was a key piece of how relationships were also strengthened. 
Moving on next to hospital integration, uh, one of the central impacts of the AMU was that midwives felt that it improved their overall integration and their awareness of the larger workings within the hospital system. So the model integrated midwives really in a way that had never been seen before. Uh, I think midwives, they spoke about the fact that previously they'd felt like they were at the margin, felt out of place. Um, and maybe even lacked a sense of belonging. They would simply come in, you know, attend their client and leave. And now they felt like they were able to be much more connected and to feel a, a sense of space. So a lot of that, as I mentioned before, came from the idea of actually having physical space on the AMU. So having a home base, they have a kitchen, they have a locker room, they have places where they can go and feel welcomed and included. And that really fostered a sense of ownership and belonging. And they felt like it was their space, not um, that they were a visitor in someone else's space. So a participant said to us, midwives tend to be scattered all over the place. This place feels like one place, one home where we can all go. Traditionally, you go to the hospital and you feel like you're in someone else's space. This has been really powerful for us. And finally, the integration and the opportunities in which um, there was a way of kind of connecting and, and building in this integration of midwives actually went a long way to creating interest with the other healthcare providers in what midwives do. So they were interested in the midwifery standards that were developed to support the AMU, and they were interested in the ways that midwives practice. And all of this actually paved the way for legitimizing a lot of midwifery um, care pathways and approaches. So the midwives described for us that other healthcare providers were showing an interest that they had never previously done about midwifery practices. So even coming over to the space and thinking about, okay, well, how do you use the bars on the wall? And how do you use the birthing chair? And tell me more about how you do that so that I can try it with my own patients. So lots of interest and legitimacy for the midwifery ways of doing things. Our final theme is around the growth of midwifery leadership. So the AMU really played a significant role in creating new opportunities for midwifery leadership um, that related to things like training for midwives and professional development. There was a really intentional approach uh, that all of our participants were aware of to helping them grow to their fullest capacity to understand things like conflict management, change management, um, and to take on more professional development that would allow them to really excel in their roles. So additional approaches to education, um, and support for professional development were really appreciated by our participants. The, um, the unit leadership really promoted midwives to, you know, also become more visible within the organization. So joining committees, being involved um, in governance procedures, um, and, and being at the table where decisions were made. And this was really a new opportunity for many midwives within the organization. And this is also tied into the idea of self-governance. So the AMU is a self-governed uh, entity, and the midwives were able to develop their own evidence-based standards, their own accountability for procedures, um, and to support their own leadership and structure within that. So this was a huge piece for how um, they were able to support midwifery decision-making at all levels. So uh, I have of my time, I will move on to the kind of big take home uh, concept you to think of um, <clears throat> our broad and far reaching uh, in the lives of wives. So it's not always easy and we're not saying that it was not a bumpy road at moments, but overall the model of the aim has had an impact on midwife ability to realize core at the essence of what we do. It promoted the ability to build strong relationships with both us and with other healthcare providers. Uh, it actually led to better hospital integration uh, and to become more integrated members of the hospital team and in leadership roles in the profession and their own hospitals and in their community that hadn't existed the birthplace and client-centered care and promotion of physiologic birth were all found to be really positive in this new model. It's reassuring that these core values have not been lost and may actually be strengthened in this model. And I think that that was unexpected by many of us on the study team and is something that I think warrants further um, you know, research and, and exploration. We've talked a lot this week about the concept of sustainability the impact on our profession. And I think it's worth noting that autonomy, you know, we know is such a huge contributor to job satisfaction. And in the early days of the 
AMU, there was a bit of a dance between the hospitalist midwives and the community midwives about how to work together and promote autonomy of practice. But overall, the unit has allowed midwives to work to their fullest scope and to feel autonomous. And they've been supported and, and that's been kind of underpinned by mentorship and training and leadership. And so that's what I would say is the final take home lesson, which is about how important and transformational it can be when midwives are given the opportunity to hold leadership positions. It strengthens the capacity for midwives to drive change and to you know, influence policy both locally in their community and beyond. So uh, this summarizes again, some of the pieces of our larger evaluation. Uh, so we've looked at the lessons learned through the implementation. We've looked in detail at client experiences, healthcare provider experiences, uh, and we're, this is part of our evaluation and you know, data related to midwifery experiences. We also have a little bit more related midwifery experiences that we're gonna unpack a bit further. We also have preliminary clinical outcomes and actually uh, Liz Darling presented recently in other forums. So we'll have a cost analysis. So those are some of the things. Situation. Um, and when it comes to the midwifery outcomes, this was the inside view of what's been happening on the AMU for midwives. Much rich data that's come from the midwifery experiences that we're working on a second piece of the analysis where we're looking at a much broader picture to see um, kind of what can be learned for the wider profession. So less about that AMU specific focus and more about lessons related to sustainability and work-life balance. So that is coming next. And stop it there in case there's time for questions. I just want to pass along my thanks to all of our participants, um, the healthcare providers, the midwives, and uh, all of the clients who also have participated in various components of this work. It's been so rich and we're learning a lot as we go. So I'm really grateful to all of them. I have some references too. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, yeah, it's just, it, this is such a nice way to tie together again, as you said, a number of the threads that have come up throughout the conference. And even I think, um, thinking just to the keynote speaker today and uh, the ways in which creating an environment in which the midwifery philosophy really is protected and enhanced um, has the, the potential to contribute significantly to protecting um, autonomy for um, for people who are giving birth and to ensure that they're um, receiving respectful experiences. So we do have some questions in the chat um, and uh, some of them are logistic ones about how the AMU works. So maybe I'll read a few of them together and you can answer, um, answer those. So uh, questions are include can community midwives admit clients to labor and delivery or only to the AMU? What happens to the backup fee from the births where the hospitalist acts in the role of the second? And um, maybe if we just do those two together, yeah. Um, yeah, and I can also put some links uh, to some of our research that's showcased some of this because we have a really, we have a couple of good publications that really outline the model at the AMU um, and the financial piece. So fee uh, has actually been used as a way to fund the existence of the unit. So the midwifery practice groups who are in that catchment area of the AMU um, use that second midwife fee to financially support and contribute to the functioning of the AMU and to pay, for example, for the um, hospitalist midwife role. Uh, at the beginning of the model being set up, there was a plan for uh, the midwives in those communities to increase their caseload um, with the thinking that their work would be offset, you know, by the work of the hospitalist midwife and that they would be able to take on an additional amount of their caseload and that additional amount would be used to fund um, the AMU functioning as well. They have seen actually that they don't need the community midwives to continue to increase their caseload to fund the model. Uh, there's been some, I think, really helpful and generous support through the Ministry of Health. Um, and so that hasn't continued to, to be necessary. And the first part of the question was, oh, about can community midwives admit clients to labor and delivery? So um, 
really essentially no. They are all admitted to the AMU if they're under midwifery care. If they need to be admitted to the labor and delivery unit due to you know, existing complications or concerns, then their care is transferred to the obstetrician. Really, the model would be if you're a midwifery client in those midwifery practice groups, your options for birth are to start labor in the AMU or plan a home birth. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so we probably have time for just one more question. So I'll just go to the next one, which is um, uh, for your thoughts about how we can facilitate AMUs in other hospitals. Yeah, this is a great question. So uh, Liz is actually the author on a paper related to the implementation lessons. And I would direct you to that because I think it's a really great paper that summarizes almost like what are the key ingredients and uh, the key components that you need to think through to be able to create something like this in your setting. There were, of course, many really unique uh, things that contributed to the perfect time and the perfect place that allowed the AMU to happen in Markham. Um, but we have actually been able to help scale up and uh, and create another midwifery led unit in Hamilton at McMaster. Uh, and that was based on a lot of the lessons learned uh, through the Markham experience. It's very unique to each place, I think, some of the ways that it unfolds and the ways that the model will operate. Um, but I think some of the core elements and the lessons for how to do it um, are really similar. I think midwifery leadership is a huge piece. That was a big, big lesson we saw from the Markham experience was having a midwife who can lead this process, be its champion, you know, rally all the other people from leadership within the organization and other healthcare providers um, that played such a huge piece in, in their success. And I think openness from the midwives to be, to try something like this. I think it felt like a huge change and a big risk, um, but I think people were, they were included in the process and there was lots of really intentional steps of dialogue and, um, and listening activities that allowed everyone, I think, to feel like their voice had been heard, even if they weren't sure that they uh, were certain that it was all going to work out. And it's interesting. So Liz and I have been doing this research. I think we probably are at the point now where we should go back and see if the story has changed, because a lot of this data was collected in the early days. And maybe things, maybe we'll have even more to learn now. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, it's been really great to hear about uh, about these findings and to have this opportunity to uh, to yeah to just talk a little bit more about all the potential benefits of um, AMUs.